Charlie Chaplin. Once film comedy was all about action. Buster Keaton, beautiful visual humour. Harold Lloyd, risking life and limb. And Lauren Hardy, as you've never seen them before. In this series, I'll show you films unseen for generations. I shall be crisscrossing Europe to bring you the finest prints, the best musical accompaniment, and in my opinion, the funniest comedians in the world. Welcome to the world of silent comedy. I can pinpoint exactly when my passion for silent comedy began. It was the summer of 1971. When I was 13 years old, I walked along here, Oxford Street. I was eager to find the Academy Cinema. They were showing a Buster Keaton film for The General on a big screen with a live pianist in the corner and a big audience. I'd never seen this before. I was thrilled. I, I couldn't wait. The cinema was just here. It's a Marks and Spencer's now. I stepped inside the cinema and suddenly realised that here was a completely magical art form. Live music was driving the film forward. I loved every inch of it. The phenomenal timing. The ingenious gags. the sheer scale of the ambition. That hour and a half changed my life. I knew what I wanted to be. I came out of the cinema and I was floating on a cushion of joy. To be laughing at jokes that were 50 years older than me was the most extraordinary experience. To me, I thought, this is Buster Keaton's immortality. He may be gone, but his jokes live on forever. And what jokes they are. Buster is one of the finest surrealist comedians who ever lived. And Buster was also a superb acrobat. Nobody else could fall like him. It's a miracle that these masterpieces survive at all. For over 40 years, Buster's films disappeared from our cinemas. Many seemed lost forever, others so damaged they were barely watchable. But today, that has all changed. I'm going to meet a man who has patiently restored many of Buster's classic films, not in Hollywood, but in Paris. Buster Keaton's comedy, like that of all the silent clowns, was universal. They had no language barrier. And the French loved Buster so much they were prepared to spend months restoring a single joke. And France has a place in Buster's story for another reason. In 1947, Buster and his wife were invited to perform at Paris's Circus Madrano. Buster was unsure how the French would react to an American silent comic, and it was 30 years since he'd been on stage. 
To Buster's huge delight, the audience loved him. To packed houses, he performed some of his favourite sketches. Buster gave some of his finest ever live performances at the Circus Madrano. To commemorate that fact, the French could have put a blue plaque on the building, but instead of that, they tore the whole thing down and put this up in the 1970s. So, nobody's perfect. Here's Buster in Paris in the 1950s. Watch for the gag with the cigarette lighter. One of the things I love about Buster Keaton is his use of surrealism. He takes, an ordinary, he takes an ordinary situation and just somehow makes it slightly different. He changes the reality of it, so it at first looks normal, but then when you look again, you realise that something terrible has really happened. Any sugar? I often find other comedians are Keaton fans, like Terry Jones of Monty Python. See if you can spot Buster's surreal influence. I think the first one that really got me, I think it was a thing called The Seven Chances. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got this big, he's got this inheritance, this huge inheritance, so long as he's married by five o'clock the next day. Yes. So he seven rushes. Seven o'clock that night. The seven o'clock that night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, then he goes off trying to find somebody to marry him. He sits in the church there waiting, and he thinks nobody's going to turn up. He's put a notice in the paper, and suddenly, People, women, brides start appearing and filling the, until the church is filled with like 500 brides. Some of them obviously men with beards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You suddenly realise that all the brides, it's all improvised uh, bridal. Yes. Things, like tea towels on their heads and for veils. <laughs> a big influence on you, on you Keaton? Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, it's like, you know, I really just wanted to make Buster Keaton films again. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting him, that's the difficulty. Uh, yeah, that's the difficulty. Um, no, definitely, I think it was this... I think also with Keaton, it was the realisation that comedy uh, didn't just have to be funny, it could be beautiful as well. Oh. We're talking about surrealism now. Um, Sherlock Jr., perhaps one oh, of the most yeah. surreal commercial movies ever made. Yes, certainly for its time. No, I mean that. Moment, I mean, again, this is the thing that sort of get me going. My juices going about Keaton. I mean, the sequence where he falls asleep and for start he does the double image thing of himself walking away from himself mm. and leaving himself asleep. <laughs> At the time, 1924, audiences would have looked at that and have just been astonished. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. Buster, the projectionist, dreams he can join the film. The genius of Keaton is that the film does what film does. It starts cutting around him.
such a joy to watch Keaton. That's why I love the Keaton films. They're just, he's beautiful. Surrealist, artistic, beautiful. Clearly you'd expect Buster's finest work to be here in the Louvre, one of the largest art collections in the world. Home, of course, to that world famous sculpture, the Buster de Mila. When I tell people that I believe that silent film comedy is a major art form, many are baffled. The problem is how the films are shown. In an appropriate setting like this, then art warms the soul. But so often in the past, silent films on television have not been shown to their best advantage. The modern size TV means that you have to crop some of the pictures so you lose the outer image. Then, of course, you may not get the original, but instead, a poor copy. And quite often, they turn out like this. And unbelievably, some of those copies then suffer with heat damage. So, as you can see, well, here's one, in fact, that I made earlier. There we are. But, of course, we haven't got the scratches, so in they go. Down there. Another one there. And uh, just one, excuse me, just there. Can you tell what it is, yes? So, rather than comic masterpieces, some people think of silent comedy as looking like this. Watching terrible prints projected at the wrong speed on small television screens with an inappropriate honky-tonk piano score reduces silent films to a bewildering succession of barely comprehensible actions involving big men in large fake beards being kicked up the arse in a monotonous fashion. Now see how it can look. Glorious, isn't it? I'm a passionate believer in silent comedy, and I want to share this forgotten art form with a new generation. Over the past few years, I've crisscrossed Britain sharing my favourite pieces of silent comedy, giving audiences the chance to see Buster on the big screen, as I first did, with live, improvised music. Thank you very much indeed. Shall we have a round of applause for Mr Neil Brand on the piano at this point? Neil improvises the music as we watch the film. He says he improvises. Uh, personally, I think he makes it up as he goes along. <laughs> um, how many people here have been to see a silent film before? Oh, a few. OK, good. That's good. One of the things about silent uh, cinema that's very uh, interesting, silent comedy, is that they, they haven't got the wherewithal to fake the, 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 the routines. They have to do it for real, and um, that's what makes it really exciting visual cinema. Have a look at this clip from a Buster Keaton film called Seven Chances, and imagine, if you would, what dialogue would add to this scene. So this is Seven Chances, Buster Keaton. <laughs>
can see from that clip there, there's no point in dialogue. There's no room for dialogue. What, what could he possibly say? Hey, watch out, or there's another rock coming. Or, you know, it <laughs> doesn't add anything to it at all. And that's the great thing about silent films, that they, although they didn't have the ability to, to, to make sound, they had to concentrate on the visual. Now, it's a, a good example there of Buster Keaton always striving for authenticity in his jokes. He, he, he could have done that in a various number of ways. Instead of one long shot, you could have had close-ups of him dodging, close-ups of rocks. It wouldn't have been anything like as effective. Buster was also a great acrobatic comedian, as well as being a great filmmaker. And when you see silent film at its best, it looks a lot like this. <laughs> always makes an audience gasp because he's, he's flying horizontally out of the screen. I, I always wonder what happens the next bit, you know? If you sort of had the camera along here, does he let go? Does he land on the roof of the cab? The man to ask is Vic Armstrong. He's been everyone from James Bond to Indiana Jones. The most prolific stuntman in the world. This is the old classic, isn't it? I love, I love his body attitude when he, he's standing so calm, he's not bending his knees, he's, he's just so natural, just standing there dead pan. But you watch him, how far he lifts off the ground, that's absolutely amazing. And so he's a very, very strong person to grab that and hold on to it. And he's kicked his feet up almost to, to shoulder height, but that's purely acting the, acting the moment. This to me is the most amazing one. There is a commercial I've been watching in the States, actually, that is uh, a parody of this today, but even the guy that does that, he must have probably two or three foot each side around him, and I believe in this one, there's about two inches of space either side. But for him to stand there and act, you know, I've always thought of this as the, the birth of stunt work, somebody that's... In those days, I'm sure they didn't think it was stunt work. It was just part of a sequence they were shooting. But little did they know they're inventing this, this business, which is in fact a you know multi-million dollar business now. And they came up with these original ideas, not only to perform them, rig them, but to perform them as an actor and not as a stunt man. So let's watch his face. He doesn't doesn't move. Absolutely not in love. He's just acting away, rubbing his eyes and shaking his head. There's no look up, there's no flinch, there's nothing. It's absolutely an amazing feat of, uh, of nerves. If I was doing this stunt, I would be, every time I'd be looking at the ground, I'd be looking up, I'd say, are you sure we've measured this correctly? <laughs> Let me just measure it once more. Um, it would be just not trusting your own judgment because that is terminal. If that went wrong, he's dead. There's no question about it. Oh, the stunts of the silent era are far, far more dangerous now today. About 10, 12 years after that, he's having a medical and he's having an X-ray done and the doctor says to him, when did you break your neck? He says, I've never broken my neck. He says, well, I'll I show you this X-ray here. And he said, these bones in the side of your neck here are broken and they're fused together again. And he said, well, I was making this film and I was on this water shoot and the water shoot was so powerful it knocked my head onto the rail and I had this terrible headache and I hit my neck on the side. Could that have been <laughs> how I could have broken my neck? <laughs> so how did, he, how did he develop this facility for sort of equating, you know, pain with comedy in many ways? He had the most extraordinary upbringing. His mother and father were part of a, a musical act in America, a vaudeville act called The Keatons. Buster joined them on stage for the first time, aged just four. They had makeups on me and walking me out as soon as I could walk in front of an audience. We were the roughest knockabout act that was ever in the history of the theatre. The act seems to have consisted of Joe beating up Buster in as many different ways as possible. As the orchestra began to play, Buster and his dad would start hitting each other. They would use brooms, planks, anything.
His father sometimes um, sews a little suitcase handle into the back of his coat so he can pick him up like this and throw him across the stage. And Buster does this, he's quite happy with this. There's hecklers in the audience one night, his dad picks him up and throws him in the audience. <laughs> it's all true, it all happened, and, and Buster, you know, loved the act. If Buster resented his dad's beatings, he never admitted it. Instead, Buster paid Joe Keaton to star alongside him. Here they are, loving father and son, together on screen. Buster risked his neck, his life, for films that were then forgotten, or worse. This is silver nitrate. It was used in silent films as a light-sensitive coating. When the talkies emerged, silent films were considered obsolete, and some producers actually melted down their films in order to extract this silver nitrate, worth approximately $15 a feature film. It doesn't make me laugh, it has no sense of comic timing, and yet some producers actually thought that this stuff was more valuable than some of the finest silent comedies ever made. Tell us a joke. Nothing. All this destruction means that today there are no known copies of over three quarters of the silent films ever made. A staggering figure. Thankfully, from attics and cupboards across the globe, lost films are still being rediscovered. We couldn't have made this programme were it not for a special breed of person. The restorers. The archaeologists of film. I went to meet a man who is keeping Buster Keaton's spirit alive, Serge Bromberg. There's a secret place in this basement. Uh -huh. This is the place for films. Oh, well, yes. yes. Serge hunts down missing silent films in Moscow junk shops, in Peruvian attics. He can never rest because old film chemically self-destructs. If we find them in five years or ten years, maybe it will be too late. Mm -hmm. It's really a race against time. For example, here you have a clip of a little bit of film that is decomposed. Oh, yes. So you, you, you do not see much, but when you unwind it, listen to the noise. It's, it's, you hear? Yes. And, and, and if you watch the image, the image is actually really melting. Yes. I mean, there's no yes. frame anymore. Yes. The film is sticky and uh, it's really terrible. Mm. And decomposition lasts about one year. So probably in six months, this film is just powder. Thankfully, Serge has saved many unique films before they crumble to dust. Ever taped a film off the telly and missed recording the last five minutes? Well, one of Buster's films, Hard Luck, is a bit like that. For 75 years, that film ended with a shot saying, well, there was a joke after this, but then the joke is gone and mm. we'll never see it again. Mm. Well, mm. you will. Mm. Here is the... I think I have it here. And he talks about this particular joke, Buster Keaton, as being the biggest laugh he got in yes. his short comedy. Yes, absolutely. And for 75 years, everybody says, oh, well, if it's the funniest joke, that's probably the best joke ever, yeah. you know, coming from Buster Keaton. That was the fade out of the picture, and that audience would be laughing getting into their cars out into the parking lots. Here is how we found it. It's, uh, it's film okay, except it has a little technical problem. Mm -hmm. It is film, but it's in 24 millimeter, which oh, well, is look at that. a technical system 
that nobody knows anything about. And uh, to preserve it, we've had to make up some kind of device, uh, special device, only for 20 meters of film. But the joke is back. Watch this, okay. Okay. This to restore the film, Serge's team first take a digital picture of each separate frame. You see that there? Whatever is missing on one frame can be substituted with what survives on another. Yeah. Now we have it perfectly steady, we have it with, with the less scratches possible. And now, a Buster Keaton joke no one under the age of 75 has ever seen. So that we had in the previous uh, version. Mm -hmm. And now here we are, yeah. finally after several years, but Buster resurfaced. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful to be able to see this. Look at this. <laughs> and that's how your dad met your mum. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's brilliant. That's film restoration. Yeah, absolutely. That is extraordinary. 80% of silent films are missing. But every single Buster Keaton film has now been reclaimed. So thanks to the dedication of Surge and restorers across the world, Buster's immortality is assured. In the early silent days, nobody thought of the film's longevity. Film it, sell it, move on, that was how it was done. And it was just this world that Buster stepped into in 1917. In New York, he bumped into superstar movie comic Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who had been impressed by Buster's stage performances. He invited Buster to join his film company, and so Buster launched his career standing on the shoulders of a giant. This is Buster's first film appearance. He's been buying sticky molasses in Roscoe Arbuckle's shop. children present that pouring hot water over bald men's heads <laughs> isn't clever but it is funny. <laughs> um, Roscoe Arbuckle became a mentor for Buster Keaton and, and, and Buster was a very uh, quick pupil and learned a lot from Arbuckle very quickly and Buster was also fascinated by the camera. The first thing I did in the studio was to want to tear that camera to pieces. I had to know how that film got into the cutting room, what you did to it in there and how you made things match. The technical part of pictures is what interested me. Soon Buster was not only acting, but also directing films. From his earliest days as a director, he loved manipulating reality. Here's a camera trick. This is definitely Buster's idea, and um, nobody at the time could quite figure out how he did it. So here's a quick extract from a film called Moonshine. One thing that Buster learned was that um, it was always funnier 
if he didn't show that he himself found it funny or, or amusing. So if something happens to him, he's got the deadpan expression, which in silent films you think would be a bit of a, uh, a difficulty because you can't talk, and so you should think that, you know, the more expression you can have, the better. But he sort of went the other way. Buster's expression barely changes, but his eyes reveal his total bewilderment. Life in early Hollywood was like a brotherhood of comedy. Buster Keaton was friends with Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who was also good friends with Charlie Chaplin. This unique photograph reveals how close Charlie and Buster's friendship was. And friends have a habit of borrowing things from each other, like jokes. Here's Charlie from 1917. He's dropped some ice cream down his trousers and he's trying to politely get rid of it. And now Buster in The Cook, a year later, the same gag. Even the woman looks the same. Now, this next, we've got three examples coming up now of exactly that kind of thing, of a comedian coming up with a gag, another comedian seeing it, uh, improving it perhaps, changing it, personalising it, and then the other comedian coming back and grabbing it again. So basically we've got Buster Keaton in The Navigator, first of all, which is 1924. Then we have Charlie again in The Gold Rush, and then we have Buster Keaton in The General, 1927. Basically the joke is, um, how do you get away from something that's pointing at you? General, Buster's film that so inspired me years ago. Perhaps, maybe I've passed on my passion for Buster Keaton like a comic baton to a new generation. Buster Keaton, a man prepared to risk serious physical injury for the sake of a gag. If he saw these steps here, he would feel compelled to throw himself down them. And in tribute to him, I shall walk down. Now let's enjoy a complete Buster Keaton film, The Goat. It has everything that makes Buster unique, like surrealism, acrobatics and beautifully crafted jokes. If I were asked to choose one Buster Keaton short to show on television, it would be The Goat. And I was. So here it is.
This has been Paul Merton's Silent Clowns. We've been watching the wonderful Buster Keaton. So until the next time, goodbye. Paul <laughs>
Burton on Charlie Chaplin next Thursday at 9. And you can see Time Shift's analysis of Chaplin's 1940 satire, The Great Dictator, on Saturday at 9.15. Tonight, stay with us as godfather environmentalism, James Lovelock, talks to Mark Lawson next. <laughs>